Hello and thank you for coming along to this short webinar about the Nonprofit Leadership at its Best, Nine Ways to Make Your Organisation Better Than the Rest. My name is Ruth Knight and I'm from the Pillars of Best Practice. For those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. I live on the Gold Coast in Queensland where I moved to um, from the UK about 14 years ago. My background's working in health, youth and education services and I've got qualifications in health counselling and also a Masters of Business from the Australian Centre of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies which is at the Queensland University of Technology in Queensland. And I'm still there, just about to complete a PhD studying organisational culture and change management within the sector. So currently I do a lot of training and consultancy with many different organisations and I'm also on the board of a non-profit organisation myself that I founded 10 years ago. But very importantly I'm also the director and founder of Pillars of Best Practice which is an online coaching programme uh, for non-profit organisations and leaders who are creating massive influence and change in their community. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Pillars of Best Practice later in the webinar. The information that I wanted to give you today was based around four questions. Uh, and these are, what are the common problems and challenges for non-profit organisations? What can make our organisation sustainable and effective? How do we determine how healthy our organisation is? And what should our managers and leaders be spending time on? So I'm going to give you my perspective on uh, these questions and uh, what I think some of the answers are, because if you're wanting to create uh, massive influence in your community, if you want your organisation to be successful and if you want to spend your time wisely on growing your organisation, then it's very important that you've got some idea about these, uh, these questions and their answers. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me uh, or get in touch with me somehow and I'll answer your questions. Just to put some context first though, um, just to make sure that we're all, we all know that the sector that you're in is defined by your organisation's purpose. So at one end, uh, we've got organisation businesses, mainly businesses and corporations that are founded because uh, they want to have financial benefit to their owners or their shareholders. And up the other end of the scale is organisations that are founded because they want to have some social benefit to the community. So any revenue or income that comes into those organisations goes back into the organisations itself or back into the activities for the community that they're, they're running or they're doing. Now many um, people call this, uh, this continuum in terms of sectors. So the businesses and the for-profits are in the first sector. Uh, we know that the second sector is usually government-run organisations. And the third sector is where the social or the charitable organisations sit. Um, there's many different names that are used. Uh, it could be non-profit sector or uh, voluntary organisations, charities. Uh, there's many different names, but basically um, they all sit in the third sector. So it doesn't mean that they're just because they're in the third sector, they're any less valuable or important than the first or the second sector. They're all very important um, to society, um, but that's just how um, they've been named and uh, you will see that I've actually got a white space in the middle and I've queried what this is and I wonder if you do know because this is potentially another sector um, but I'm not going to reveal the answer just yet I'm going to tell you what it is at the end of the webinar so stay tuned and we'll come back and reveal what that potential fourth sector is in a few moments. Now the non-profit sector is a very important part of our society. Uh, we know in Australia that we have more than 700,000 entities, um, that most, most of which are small, um, but they are growing. So back in 1995, we only had about 520,000 and, and, and now, as I said, we have over 700,000. So we know that these organisations are growing. 
but they um, provide a wide range of services. Um, you know, it includes education and health and employment and counselling and legal advice and religious services. Um, there's also some really large organisations that are often um, hospitals or providers of aged care, um, environmental groups, churches, religious and political organisations. We have art galleries, um, performing arts and other schools and other education providers. So there's a massive array of organisations that work in this sector doing some amazing things for their community. So it really is um, very important what these organisations do. But it's not just that, um, they are very economically viable as well. Uh, in Australia, again, we have about 38,000 non-profit organisations that employ staff and a further 3,000 that are also deemed um, by the Australian Bureau of Statistics to be economically significant. So 900,000 people in Australia equates to about 8% of all employees in Australia. So um, it's no small group of employees. And working alongside those employees, we also know that there's another 4.6 million volunteers working in the, in the sector. Um, and they've worked out that that wage equivalent of those volunteers would be about 15 billion a year. So again, a significant amount of people um, that are working in the sector and making it a very vibrant and economically viable. Now, where are these people working? Uh, well, some uh, it's a little bit old, it's back in 2000. Um, they did some uh, research on where these people were working. Um, so we know that roughly, prob probably it's similar now, but um, back then it was community services, health and education uh, that were the biggest groups of employees, uh, employers. And uh, there's, but there, of course there are people working in other parts of the sector as well. And just to let you know that also in America, uh, it's also a very big sector and uh, they have over 10 million people working in the sector over there. That's without the volunteers. Um, so in America, it's the third largest workforce um, behind only retail and man manufacturing. And in Australia, um, it, our sector is bigger than the communications, agriculture and tourism industries together which means that it's uh, a huge uh, input into the economy. Um, 74 billion a year, uh, and yeah, 76 billion a year, sorry, goes through this um, industry. So it's a growing sector economically and in terms of size and diversity, um, but comes uh, what comes with that is power and influence because of course, um, you know, with that amount of people that are employed and the, doing such great work, and the government acknowledges the significant role that the sector plays. Um, they've said that a strong, vibrant and, and innovative not-for-profit sector is essential to achieving a productive and inclusive Australia. Um, but we know it's much more than just about economics. Um, Professor Mark Lyons once said um, that non-profit organisations make an even more important contribution to society through their demonstration of and thus encouragement for collective action. They play a central role in the regeneration of social capital and non-profit organisations also sustain and shape a democratic democratic political system they are the elementary schools of democracy so um, you know social capital really refers to quality of life issues such as safety trust and sense of purpose um, and it also describes the changes to individual community connectedness health and well-being so non-profit organizations give us ways to celebrate build and protect the many human values that give rise to healthy thriving communities so we really can't underestimate the importance and power of the sector and and how it works together and within our society but of course with great power comes great responsibility uh, we need to ensure that our sector maintains its vibrancy and its economic significance we can't allow it um, to not be successful really if we want our community to stay successful or to build and, and thrive and grow 
So organisations that are working in this sector then, um, I really believe need to look at two different areas um, that they need to focus on if they want to um, achieve success. Um, that they need to be both good at the systems, the management and leadership required to run the organisation. So that's, you know, your efficiency, your effectiveness and your engagement and how you run your organisation. But you also need to be uh, very mindful about your mission, your purpose and your outcomes and the impact that you're trying to create within uh, your organisation and your community. So these are the two very important elements. Success just doesn't happen by chance anymore. Uh, We need to be very focused and strategic about how the nonprofit sector is and and your organisation in particular is going to grow and thrive. So what are some of the challenges then um, that most organisations face? Um, Because unfortunately, the critical things that are going to gain you success are also the things that give you the biggest challenges. And what I thought we'd look at very quickly is six common challenges that all nonprofits um, face. And if you'd like to score yourself on on these these challenges. I I sent out a handout that you can use or you can contact me for a handout about these challenges just so that you can understand yourself a little bit about how you're going and and if these challenges are affecting you. The first one, unsurprisingly, (laughs) is funding. Um, Australia, for instance, is a very big country with lots of needs. Um, However, very interestingly, Uh, The World Giving Index, which is the first report of its kind looking at charitable behaviour around the world, um, they looked at three different types of charitable behaviour, giving money, giving time, helping a stranger, and they used the results to produce the World Giving Index. And interestingly, and and very nicely, um, Australia and New Zealand topped the list. So that's really great for such tiny populated countries um, because they are obviously, we are a very giving organization, a giving country. Um, However, um, that's balanced across, you know, the great needs that we have, you know, anything from disadvantage to disasters and, um, and all the other needs that we have in our community to make it strong and vibrant. Interestingly, just to let you know, that study um, that I just mentioned also found that being happy is more of an influence on giving money to charity than being wealthy. So the more happy we are, the more likely we are to give. And so it's very important that as a nation we try and stay as happy as we can so that we know that we're willing to help out others. But the challenge is that there are, as I mentioned before, simply more organisations now than ever before. And there is less funding to go around. Um, That's not, you know, that's a a world issue. There's the economic crisis that's going on around the world and also, you know, the crises that are happening in our own country. So um, fundraising can't really be an ad hoc approach anymore. Um, financially, the world is changing and, and things are happening all the time to make, give up, make us demands on our money and our spending. And so really as an organisation that relies on funding, we really need to think about you know, what are our strategies and how are we engaging people to donate and give to our organisations financially. A recent uh, report that's just come out by Wendy Scaife and her colleagues from QUT, um, it's it's called uh, Who's Asking for What? Fundraising and Leadership in Australian Nonprofits. And the report suggests that the sector is in a state of flux and change. And they found that while um, there is a lot of fundraising going on, uh, many organisations are having to think differently and develop fresh skills either to enter the fundraising market or to cope better with rising competition for community and corporate support. And this new reality affects boards, CEOs and fundraisers alike. So it's going to um, take a lot of information about fundraising um, and I'm going to do that in other webinars around, you know, what does this mean for you as an organisation and how can you make sure that you're keeping up um, with the new technologies and the new ways that people are giving. Um, It's all extremely important for you to know if you're going to maintain some success um, with raising money and working with donors and funders. 
you can uh, I've just put the uh, link there if you want to download the full report and uh, read what else Wendy has to, Wendy Scaife and her colleagues have to say about that the second challenge I wanted to talk about though was boards, um, otherwise known as boards of management or management committees, um, directors of your organisations. Now boards have significant legal and moral duties and they have increasing compliance issues and complex organisations to manage and govern. Um, but they're normally volunteers from the local community and some of them have very little experience or knowledge about financial monitoring, strategic planning, governance or fundraising. And, and they typically don't even like to get involved in fundraising. So it's um, quite a challenge to work with this um, very passionate group of people who um, need to keep up to date with the skills around governance and what their duties and responsibilities are. Um, it's very easy, unfortunately, for boards to become ineffective and very dysfunctional uh, because it's such a, a passionate group of people with some very different ideas about how to run their organisations. So there's lots of issues involved in making sure that these boards are running well and know what their duties and their functions are. The third challenge is managing staff and volunteer performance and dealing with HR issues. Unfortunately, according to a study conducted by the Dale Carnegie training, um, disengaged workers outnumber engaged workers by a pretty significant margin. Uh, they found that only 45% of managers and supervisors and 23% of people at other levels qualify as engaged. Um, and that means feeling enthusiastic, empowered, inspired and confident in their jobs. So I know that was done in the in the corporate sector, but I think it's probably I'm fairly confident that it's the same in the nonprofit sector. So if only 45 percent of employees are engaged, then what are the other 55 percent potentially doing? You know what? They're probably not performing to their optimum or they possibly could be your biggest headache. And um, as, ma as a manager, you probably know that one of the biggest challenges is trying to figure out how to address and change poor performance. And most nonprofit organisations don't really have the time or the money to be spending on people with poor performance or are not very engaged or are not really um, producing the outcomes that they need um, to be in the nonprofit sector. One of the worst problems that we have within the workplace is poor communication. And no wonder, because about 45% of employees say they don't receive the information they need to do their job well. So, you know, it's very frustrating for them. And 65% of organisations experience major interdepartmental communication problems. And 54% of employees say their performance reviews are useless. So poor communication is really costing us a significant amount of time and resources to manage unproductivity, low morale and poor engagement. So it's one of the areas that is um, you know, very difficult for organisations, but it's also a big waste of time and money. The fourth challenge is conducting good research, monitoring engagement and assessing how to improve your organisations. Unfortunately, um, so many organisations just, they kind of hope and pray they're doing good work and they, they think they are because, you know, people tell them you've got a great organisation, but they don't really collect any evidence to prove it. Um, there's no real good monitoring or, or research conducted to making sure that they are um, getting the outcomes that they need. Um, I've spoken to organisations who, who don't do any surveys with their staff or their volunteers and they don't collect feedback from their clients. So they're not really able to assess how well they're doing or if they can improve or how they could improve their organisation and what they're doing. The fifth, fifth challenge um, on from that is measuring their impact. So we need to obviously understand how we're doing but we also need to understand are we achieving the mission? Are we achieving the outcomes and the impact that we set out to do? So there's a lot of uh, agreement about having clear metrics to measure a program's success. Um, it's important, you know, not just to rely on subjective photos and stories. 
but strong evaluation frameworks to measure clearly what and how much a program has contributed to society or your community where the project was implemented is critical because it helps you understand what you're achieving and how you can get better at it. I mean, you only need to look at a profession like sport um, to think about, you know, well, it would be unheard of in sport to not measure your achievements and keep refining what you do until you become better and better at achieving your impact. You know, you have a coach to help you look at how well you're doing and to train you and support you as you come be become better in your sport. So, you know, why would it be any different in the third sector? Um, we are facing unprecedented challenges in our communities and we're trying to change behaviours, attitudes, policies and practices. So we really need to know if what we're doing is working. We can't just um, hope and pray that what we're doing is best practice. We really need to know and, and measure that. The other reason that we should be measuring our impact is because there's a lot of money going through the sector. Um, there's a lot of money and uh, coming from uh, grants and philanthropic trusts, etc. And these people are relying on us to really give them a return on their investment and to demonstrate that we are spending, you know, grants and fund and donations well. And um, there, in fact, there's more pressure than ever before, really, I suppose, um, to show the results of what we're doing and that we're not just, you know, doing good anymore, but we're really doing something significant within our communities. And the sixth challenge is developing a healthy organisational culture. So long gone are the days where you could be an autocratic leader and expect people to, you know, uh, be motivated um, by autocratic leaders. Today, we really need to think about how we engage our staff and how we support them and motivate them in really good, strong ways that really, um, yeah, encourages people to, people to do the best they can. Um, you only have to look at the bullying and harassment that happens in workplaces. It costs the economy about 15 billion a year um, because unfortunately bullying and harassment is so rife uh, within our in, within our organizations. So again, unfortunately, it doesn't not happen in the nonprofit sector. Um, it has dire social and financial co consequences. So really, um, and it's not just bullying, it's, it's the culture impacts, uh, work relationships, work-life balance, productivity, employee turnover, and unethical behavior. So we really need to look at the whole of our organization in terms of the culture and how it's working and how it's engaging our staff and volunteers and how it's motivating them. So if we don't have a good workplace culture, um, organizations will not thrive and grow in healthy ways because it's so important you know it's so dependent on how uh, our people are doing and how healthy and, and, and well they're feeling. Um, there's research out there to suggest that many companies have a lack of employee engagement and this can cost you know anywhere between 35 percent and 50 percent of payroll so you only have to look at turnover and sick days and conflict and complaints within your organization to see this is true. So if, if you even have a low sense of engagement and, and there's conflict within your organization, then you really probably are wasting some time and resources that you don't have. So those are the really the six um, challenges that many organizations face and I wonder how you felt that you were going with all of those challenges are they challenges for you or do you feel that you know you've got some great strategies and um, approaches to making sure that you can overcome the barriers to um, creating some success and um, sustainability well, I thought that what we'd do is just look at what sustainability means, because if you um, are not wasting your time on conflict and poor performance, um, then you should be out there really working on your fantastic projects and meeting your funders and making sure that um, your organisation is uh, sustainable. So I don't have time to share all of my recommendations today, but I thought I would just, in the next few minutes, take some really important ones that I think will make a massive difference to your organization. 
sustainability can be different things to different people but this is my take on it I really believe that sustainability um, means to be resilient despite the uncertain and competitive environment within the nonprofit sector so it means capacity resilience adaptability being relevant and flourishing uh, and and doing well in everything that you're doing but it's very importantly an integrated approach between three things which is your role and responsibilities that means your your governance and your leadership team that's how they make good choices and decisions for the organization so it includes developing an appropriate and effective business model um, strategic planning uh, financial management and leading staff and volunteers with vision and competence so it's extremely important that your, um, your governance team and your leadership team are running the organization well. But it's also very importantly about relationships, which is the way that you engage and develop partners. Now, both with internal partners, so your uh, employees and your volunteers, but also your external partners, so your funders and your um, donor donors. And thirdly, I believe it's really important um, to look at the results. So if you're able to define what you do, uh, why and what outcomes you deliver, you're putting yourself in a much better place to actually gain and retain your donors and funders and develop that engagement and partnerships that you need. So it's a very important uh, three factors here, which I'll, I'll go into just a little bit more about. Um, the mission driven governance, if you've not heard of that term or you want to know more about that term, I've actually done a practice guide that you can download from my website so you can have a little look at what that means and see um, if you can make sure that your organisation has some idea about how you drive and how you manage your organisation, um, keeping your mission in mind. Relationships, so I, I alluded to the fact that there are two different types of partnerships and relationships that you need to concentrate on um, internal partnerships that's with your staff and your volunteers so their job satisfaction is critical to your organization's success because they're the people out there doing the work but they're also ambassadors for your organization and externally the partners um, that you need to maintain relationships with are your donors your supporters your funders the media and everybody else that supports your organization so they're critical to the long-term sustainability of your organization and and at, but as you know you know partnerships and relationships don't happen overnight and um, sometimes you need to work at developing and nurturing those relationships which can take you know some strategic uh, approaches and you need to take time to do that but it's really important that you communicate um, with your donors and with your employees and make sure that you build the brand so that people are compelled to um, support you and stay committed to you as you grow and thrive. I did mention again that communication was a critical part of the way of engaging people and um, there are so many different ways that you communicate every day with people. And I expect that if you worked it out, what kind of percentage you spent on communication, it would be a lot, a lot of percentage of your time. So you've got to really work out, you know, how influential is that communication and how well are you doing that communication? Could you get better at using the communication to engage and uh, maintain those relationships? 83% of highly effective organizations state that communication is an essential part of their organization's overall strategy. So I wonder how important it is to you and your organization. Do you really focus on communication and how well you're doing that? Because you may find um, that it is critical to your success. The third area uh, that in terms of sustainability is results. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, a very great leader, once said, however beautiful the strategies, you should occasionally look at the results. But so many times we forget to do this or we only do it in a very informal, ad hoc way. We don't really think about what is it that we're trying to achieve here? You know, what are our results? 
um, you know, we don't put strategies in place to help our staff and volunteers evaluate everything that they do and then help them to reflect and refine our projects and activities to make sure that we're getting better at what we do. So results really do matter. And in a world where nonprofits are facing greater competition than ever before um, in terms of attaining funding and donor support, providing tangible results for your work might be the most important unique selling um, point and tool of leverage that you have in terms of uh, standing above the crowd. If you're able to show your results and have some evidence about what you're doing and why, uh, this really is going to put you ahead of the crowd. So it's very important for funders um, because you only need to really put yourself in their shoes for a few minutes to realise that if you only have so much money to spend um, on, on donations and you're looking at all these organisations that are asking you for funding, um, then who do you give your money to? Most will think about, well, who is going to give us the most return on investment? Or um, we often call it SROI, which is social return on investment. Now, they might not actually use those words, but that's social return on investment is one term given to organ or grant makers who are thinking, well, if I invest in this organisation, what type of investment am I going to get out of that? Um, and it's it's often what they are thinking now i was looking at a uh, a media press release from perpetual which is a large uh, grant maker in australia one of the largest and they give out a significant amount of funding every year and their press release um, back in 2011 said that it could only fund about 200 of the 1200 applications that it received um, so here in the press release it said that 1,135 not-for-profits applied for funding. So that's up from 917 in 2010. And the amount requested also rose from 84.5, uh, from 68.9 million up to 84.5 million. So you can see clearly that the number of organisations applying for money is, is increasing but the amount that is being asked for is also obviously increasing as well. Now, um, Perpetual um, had a lot of people that they did not recommend for funding. So people who didn't get through to the shortlist or, or were successful in funding. And I just had a look to see why that was uh, so. And Perpetual states that there's two reasons why people didn't get funded. One was because there were just too many applications and not enough funding but also because applicants didn't rate highly against the assessment criteria that was set out in their guidelines. They were actually selected um, on the basis of their ability to meet four criteria, strategy, outcomes, capability, and leadership. So these are critical areas for you to think about when you're applying for money because if you are the funder and you've got to pick or choose the organisations to give your money to, then you're really going to look at the ones that can show how successful they are in these four areas. Now, Mr. Thomas from um, Perpetual said that in this competitive funding environment, successful applications will have been able to articulate what success for their organisation looks like and how they're achieving it. Funders want to know that their contribution will have a genuine impact in the community and that their dollar is going as far as possible. So funders really are wanting to know what types of impact you're making and how you're doing that and they want some evidence for that. It's no good just saying we've got a good idea. You've really got to understand why it's a good idea and the evidence for that. But also, um, you know, not to just say that it's the cheapest possible project. Um, you know, it frustrates me when, you know, people just think they've got to put in for the cheapest amount for this activity or this service that you want to provide. Because I don't actually think cheap is always better. You know, in the nonprofit sector, we often run on the smell of an oily rag, really. Um, but that 
does a disservice to many. It's not fair to our staff and our volunteers, our clients or our community who need to have a very well run and well resourced sector. So um, although they do want um, social return on investment, um, it's very important to ensure that you are providing um, some evidence around the fact that you're providing a good service with leadership and outcomes um, that you want. So the first thing to, to realize is that you need, you need to stop gambling about your chances to win a grant. You've got to get serious about demonstrating your results and your commitment to evaluation and best practice. Because when you do that, you are going to really stand out from the crowd and it's not just going to be a lottery. You're actually placing yourself in a good position to win grants. But the other question is about how healthy your organisation is because you need to actually prove your organisation's capability to run projects and run services. And so just as if you were going to a doctor's and um, they were going to give you a health check, um, it's you need to actually think about yourself and think about how healthy are we, how much do we have the capacity to run the programmes and services that we, we want to run. Now, what do I mean by healthy? Um, well, what I mean by that is an organisation that um, has good governance, that is focused on the right priorities, it has good, strong vision and leadership, and it follows best practice in everything it does within uh, your policies and, pr and practices. You know, how are you doing um, compared to other people? Because, of course, um, a doctor just doesn't look at you. They know what the general population is and understands what healthy is compared to the average person. Now, this is very hard in the nonprofit sector because we're such a diverse uh, group of organisations and people. But best practice is a practice or approach that represents the most efficient or prudent course of action and that is used as a benchmark. And again, it's very difficult um, to do this within the sector because um, many people say, well, we're just too diverse. How can you benchmark um, organisations? Well, it's a question that I've been battling with for about 10 years and, and I've been trying to find ways of doing it and by um, sort of myself going around lots of different organisations and really working out what's working well for some and what isn't working well for others, that's given me the ability to sort of write down some benchmarks um, and so to enable to me to put those um, into a position where other organisations can have a look at that, I've called it the pillars of best practice. And these pillars, there's nine of them, uh, are aimed at guiding your discussion in your organisation about how you operate and if you are adhering to best practice. Because if you are, you are going to place yourself in a much better position um, to engage your staff, to engage your donors and to receive more funding. Now there are nine pillars that cover everything from preparation, principles, planning, promotion, people, processes, performance, partnerships and proof. And if you go to the pillars of best practice, you'll have a, have a look at those if you like and um, have a look at the goals on the outside. Now with under each of those goals though, there are seven indicators that help you assess to see whether you are meeting that pillar. So it's very important to realise there is a process to making sure that you are um, aligning up with this best practice. And the, the pillars are not meant to be legalistic or idealistic. They're just um, quite visionary standards that are very achievable, but they help you be successful and they help you stand out from the crowd. And like anything, it's good to have, you know, um, something to aim for, because if you're not quite sure what you're doing or what you should be spending your time on, um, then you could be just shooting in the dark and it's taking far too long for you to learn the skills all by yourself. So the pillars are a really good way of helping you aim in the right direction um, and know what you should be doing to ensure that you are achieving success. I love this quote by Gerald Abrahams, who was a, uh, a world champion chess player who used to play blindfolded. 
And he once said, good positions don't win games, good moves do. And I love that quote because it reminds me that it's not just about what you're doing now that really counts. It's the moves that you're going to make or it's the positioning that you're placing yourself in to make those moves that's going to determine whether you're going to be successful or not. So in light of that, you know, what do you think your managers and leaders should be doing? Should they be making the moves that's going to help their organisation be successful so that when you're applying for money or when you're talking to donors, when you're um, putting in submissions, you're going to be um, positioning yourself to achieve success. John Maxwell is another great uh, author and business coach who once said the single biggest way to impact an organization is to focus on leadership development. There is almost no limit to the potential of an organization that recruits good people, raises them up as leaders and continually develops them. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, really, that you, you wouldn't consider building something without getting the plans right, without getting the leadership and the project management right. Um, because if you do that, then everybody's going to come together, work as a team and achieve the goal that you want to. So it's absolutely essential that you recruit good leaders who are going to oversee your organisation and engage with your staff and your donors and work on the things that are going to make your organisation successful. Now, if you think of yourself as a team, a team that's out there to do something fantastic for your community, um, then you need the skills, the tools and the strategies to help you do it. Um, you don't want to go out there and not work strategically, otherwise you're just going to miss the ball and um, well, losing will become a habit rather than winning. So are you positioning then yourself to get those funds you need? Are you positioning yourself for success? Because if you're not, then you need to look at what the challenges are that your organisation is facing and spend some time on making sure that you are all, you're healthy throughout the whole of your organisation and particularly in those three areas of sustainability. Now, I do have a free guide that you can download called the 10 fundraising mistakes that can be fatal to your organization. So if you would like to at least start with those 10 mistakes that other people do that you need to make sure that you're aware of and that you're not um, doing, because really those things could be fatal to your organization if you're not aware of the common mistakes that other people make. So please feel free to go to the Pillars of Best Practice and download that free report for yourself. Now I did say that in, at the end I would come back to this, uh, this question about what is this potentially fourth sector? What is going on here? What is this, uh, this place in the middle that is a, a hybrid, I suppose, between the first, second and third sector? Well, it's potentially called the fourth sector and um, it's considered a, a growing area within the within society I suppose in terms of you know it's a hybrid between the for profits and making money and being financially and uh, economically sustainable um, but it's got some very good social outcomes and, and, and it's very much about what the organization is achieving and um, in Australia, you'll often you might hear of the word social enterprise. That's what it can be called over here. And we know that the the sector has increased in um, in Australia by thirty seven percent over the last five years. So it's definitely a growing area. And I would say that if you're in the third sector, you need to take a good look at this and see how it's going to affect you. Um, because more and more social enterprises are, are starting up every day. One of them I've just put here as a, a, as a, a case study is just to show you that Street is a social enterprise providing homeless youth with a supported pathway to long-term careers in the hospitality industry and they run street cafes in Melbourne. 
So that's just, you can have a look up, uh, have a look at what they're doing. Um, but that's an example of a social enterprise that um, are using uh, the business-like strategies of the first sector, but also have some very good social outcomes and social goals as well. So I'm going to be talking a lot more about the fourth sector in other webinars, and um, I hope that you'll join me for those other ones. So what did you get out of today? Um, just perhaps you can note down, you know, what are the biggest challenges for your organisation and how can you make your organisation more sustainable and effective? What do you need to be thinking about in terms of your long term sustainability? Because it's about positioning yourself and making the right moves um, for the long term success that you want to need. You need to think about how healthy your organisation is and whether it has the capability and the leadership skills to be able to make sure that your organisation is functioning and working well. And then think about, well, what, what should our managers and leaders be spending our time then? If we're going to position ourselves well, how do we make sure that we are really um, working as a team and knowing that we, we're practicing uh, our activities and our governance as well as we can be. And then you might want to have a look at the pillars of best practice and see how those nine pillars are going to help you. You know, will it give you some focus? Will it give you some idea about how to position yourselves in a much better way? So be smart, um, get your team together, think strategically, um, and don't forget to download your free guide, 10 Fundraising Mistakes That Can Be Fatal to Your Organisation. Um, just go to my homepage there and have a look at it and just make sure that you're making the right moves to win those grants or to um, get the donations that you need and want. So what are you taking away today? How did that webinar help you? I hope that you've taken away some ideas and you've, your, your head is buzzing with some thoughts and ideas. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. So thank you very much for your time today and good luck with everything you're doing and um, yeah, lots of success to you and your organization. Goodbye.